Welcome to the Clear to Send podcast, a podcast about wireless engineering, where we educate you on Wi-Fi technology, talk about design tips, troubleshooting, interviews, and the tools. Here are your hosts, Roel and Francois. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash clear to send and browse the fantastic selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Again, go to audibletrial.com slash clear to send. Hi guys, welcome back to a brand new Clear to Send episode. This is Francois, your host. Uh, Roel cannot make it today, so this is me. Uh, but I'm joined by a great Wi-Fi engineer named Chris uh, Reed. Hi Chris, how are you? I'm excellent, how are you? I'm very good. Uh, so Chris, you've been on the show a couple of episodes back. We've talked about Stadium Wi-Fi. Uh, if you guys haven't listened to the episode, it's episode number 123. So you can go to cleartosend.net slash 123 to listen to it. Um, so during the first episode, we talked about, you know, Wi-Fi uh, stadium um, design uh, practices. Um, and here you're back today to talk about implementation. So after the design, when it's time to implement the Wi-Fi in a stadium environment, um, you know, uh, we're here to talk about that today, what to think about, uh, the important thing to keep in mind, the process, the different steps, and so on. Uh, so Chris, why don't you uh, briefly present yourself for uh, those of uh, you out there that don't, don't know you yet? Um, sure. Uh, thanks for having me back. This is... Uh, uh, there's so much involved in the topic that uh, it's uh, you really need to break it up into multiple sections to uh, to try to uh, to try to cover everything. So yeah. uh, I'm Chris Reed. I'm lead network engineer with BEI Networks. Uh, we do uh, um, wired and wireless implementations and services. And uh, one of my focuses over the past past few years has been uh, LPV deployments, uh, particularly in stadiums and arenas. Perfect. So when we talk about uh, implementation. Uh, what what do you think would be the first uh, step or first thing to think about? Maybe the the the, the planification, the uh, the project management. Um, it, yeah. So the, um, the the more the more I do in uh, um, not just in LPV but in networking, the more uh, the more I found uh, good project managers to be. Uh, um, both incredibly important and uh, incredibly rare to find. So, uh, so having a, a good project manager uh, for a large-scale deployment uh, can really make things go a lot easier. Is uh, the bringer down of red tape and uh, and someone to track uh, um, to track and bring together uh, multiple functions and multiple um, multiple team members together uh, is incredibly important. And if you don't have that as a dedicated role, is uh, is really trying to take that on yourself and, uh, and making sure that everything, um, everything moves along in an orderly fashion. And when we think about, uh, you know, Wi-Fi stadium, um, uh, we, we usually focus on the R side, right? The antenna, the APs and so on, but Wi-Fi is actually just a piece of it, right? We have to think about the other network functions, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, the RF component is uh, is a, a small piece. It's an important piece, but it's a small piece in the whole uh, the whole network. Is that uh, if you deploy if you deploy a phenomenal Wi-Fi network into an environment with uh, poor switching infrastructure and routing infrastructure, without enough internet bandwidth, uh, without the DNS and DHCP. Uh, services needed to cover the number of people that you're trying to uh, to service uh, that it's it's going to fail, and you're going to run into complaints that the Wi-Fi isn't working when when you know that the Wi-Fi is working, but it's those uh, it's those secondary pieces that uh, that are falling down, but that uh, um, that doesn't stop the complaints from rolling in. So when you're doing a deployment, uh, if you don't control those components, you need to get in contact with and uh, and make sure that they're sized to support the effort uh, that's ongoing to uh, 
within the environment. Yeah, because it's not always going to be your team uh, creating the DHCP scopes and, and handling the servers. You can have to interact with other teams. So like you said, during the implementation, implementation, it's good to be in contact with them just uh, in case you have an issue. Uh, you know, they're right there to help you um, moving on. Yeah, and uh, I think I think colleges are, are a good example of this is that you may be relying on some of the campus infrastructure uh, to service um, the large venues um, at, the, at the college. So uh, you may need to work with their their IT group um, it, that they may have a dedicated Internet pipe, but you may be relying on their DNS services or DHCP. So making make sure you understand the people that are responsible for for those components and, and how to get a hold of them. And uh, make sure that they understand the scale that's being deployed and some things that you may have learned along the way. Um, for instance, on the firewalls is that uh, you can't just throw one public IP address at it and call it good if you're servicing 32,000 clients. Uh, you're going to run into pad exhaustion and uh, have some, uh, some pretty poor performance as a result of it. So uh, making sure they understand what needs to happen in order to increase uh, the performance and service the number of clients that you're adding to their infrastructure. And that the, uh, also that some components you're able to think about when you do the design and you can just plan it ahead of time before the, the actual implementation, right? It, yeah, this, yeah, this shouldn't be a surprise to every, everyone when you show up to do it, to yeah. do the deployment that, uh, part of the, um, Part of the pricing should be if you were taking care of this and, and you're doing the upgrades um, on uh, for the other components that uh, they should know that there's going to be things added or at the very least highlighted that that your infrastructure is going to need to support X, Y and Z. So now you've done the design, you're ready to go. Um, you're ready to implement your, your network. Where do you start? Uh, do you have to go on site? Uh, what type of documentation are, are you going to use? Um, you know, what type of team are you expecting to work with? Um, yeah, so for the documentation perspective, you should have some pretty robust documentation from your design phase. Is that You should have gone on site already to develop this design. You should have had some proof of concepts access points in place um, to develop your design models that then feed into your predictive design. Um, so if, if you've got all of that fed into um, Ekahau or an IB wave, that you've got some great spots on a map and you've got some, um, some information documented, uh, but I haven't found the feature set of either Ekahau or IB wave to be robust enough to use as the single source of truth during an install um, is that uh, I'm going to pick on Ekahau, but I'm really not. I love the product. It's just, uh, it's just a shortcoming when it comes to, uh, to the installation phase um, is that they have a notes section, but that notes section is unstructured data. So you can fill in antenna model and you can fill in angle and you can fill in room or section row and seat. But trying to pull that out and hand it over to an installer that may not have a laptop, um, that's where things start to fall down. So, so how do you transfer the information to the installer? Um, we've developed a process where we rely on, a, on an Excel spreadsheet um, that has um, all of the information uh, as part of it. So it's got columns for... Um, for the section, the row, the seat, the name, the power of the channel, um, the antenna model, the angle, um, all within a spreadsheet. But being able to hand that off to a to an installer um, that may not know the stadium all that well um, still has some downsides. So we take that and combine it with Visio, and use the Excel spreadsheet as a database for Visio shapes, okay. and recreate the the Ekahau or IB Wave design within Visio. So what that allows us to do is spin up different uh, PDF uh, visualizations that show the dot on the map along with maybe the model and the antenna or um, the antenna angle or the section row and seat right next to the dot. Um, so the spreadsheet becomes our single source of truth. And then the map can be handed off to 
the installer with only the information that they may need. Okay. Have you sent a request to Ikaha to add all these details to the uh, uh, like AP object or something? Uh, yes, uh, I've got a couple of ESS requests in uh, okay. that. Uh, for those that don't, don't know, on Twitter, if you do a hashtag ESS request, um, I believe it's automated that it goes into their uh, their request yeah. uh, pool. But I've got I've got some requests for um, tabled structured data um, and custom fields, which will go a long way towards alleviating mm. some of those pains. So if you've got a table data that you can show all of the APs and then bulk like at it and, uh, and be able to, to tweak. I like um, the custom field idea. It, yeah. And it, the, the benefit of that versus the notes field is that it becomes structured data and you can export it and then yeah. spin it around into um, config scripts or into a spreadsheet um, to hand off to other tools. Yeah. Um, the other benefit of what we do with the with Excel is that uh, once you figure out a naming convention, you can utilize the fields that you've used. So let's say section row and seat, uh, and then auto create names using uh, concatenate uh, within Excel. So uh, being able to have AP dash, if you've got an AP identifier, an asset, number, you can insert the asset number, the section, the row and seat. And when any of those fields change, the name will automatically update. Okay. That's pretty cool. So once you give those documents to, to your installers, um, first of all, how many installers do you need to deploy, you know, Wi-Fi in a stadium? Let's say, I'm not sure, like maybe 20,000 seats. Um, it, it'll really depend on the schedule is that, uh, y you can do it with one, <laughs> you can do it with one guy or two guys, but, uh, um, but that schedule is going to, uh, is going to push out quite a bit. Um, so it's, it's really going to be up to, um, the deployment schedule and any, uh, any weather concerns that you may have. So if you're deploying in an outdoor environment in Minnesota, um, you probably want to get done before end of October. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And, and do you just hand over the documentation or just do you go on site with the team, uh, do a walkthrough, do a little training and then um, give, give you guidance ahead of the installation? Um, yeah, the, the walkthroughs are important because you've got you've got all this great data in the spreadsheet and you've got it into um, the, those Visio or if you're utilizing Ekahow, you've got it into Ekahow. Um but it's two dimensional on a, uh, on a drawing and, uh, hopefully it's a newer stadium and hopefully you've got good drawings, but you don't always have it. So, uh, walking through with the installers and looking at every space and every deployment model, uh, is important to be able to get them to visualize where you picture them being installed and, uh, and how they're going to be getting the cables to them, uh, to the APs, uh, yeah. When you do the walkthrough, they can they can address any concerns that they may have with with getting the cabling to the access point. Is yeah. uh, you, you may think that this pole is a phenomenal place uh, from an RF perspective to put your access point, um, but if they've got a core or channel through concrete uh, 200 feet, uh, there may be some concerns with that. And trying to find alternative places to uh, um, to put that maybe the, the best way to move forward. So talking about cables, let's say you're installing AP under the seats. Do you core drill every AP location to run your cable or do you run a whole bunch of cable at one location and then you use, um, a conduit to run the cables along, along the seats under the seats? Uh, uh there are really pros and cons to both, um, to both models is that if you're going to core under every single, uh, access point, uh, the benefit is that there's no, there's no cables or uh, conduit outside of your, um, your enclosure if you're doing an underseat. So, uh, but you've got more, more core holes that have to go in place. So typically will be a higher cost installation and you've got more penetration points, which may leak down the road. Uh, so if you've got, uh, unfinished face underneath, uh, that you don't want, uh, mm. 
you, you don't want a bucket of water being dumped on the head Excuse of the fans. Yeah. Um, but if you've got finished spaces underneath as well, uh, you don't want to be de- destroying um, the lovely uh, ceiling that they just put in or, uh, or the carpeting or anything else underneath it. Uh, when you do, when you core in a single location and then try to run conduit across that you may be running into cable length limitations because you may have to go past your AP and then come back. Uh, you may be running into uh, areas where if you're going across a stair tread, uh, you may have to uh, drill out and, uh, and cut out or jackhammer uh, a tread and then repair it in order to run the conduit through it. Uh, and you've also got some aesthetics concerns with, uh, with the conduit, uh, either flex or solid, um, running in between the access points uh, under the seat. So who makes the final decision in this type of situations? Uh, it, typically it's the venue, uh, okay. and, uh, whether it be facilities, uh, uh, whether it be facilities who may have some concerns with the number of, of core holes or, um, the whoever aesthetics. the stakeholder is for yeah. the, the team or the, or the venue, uh, who may have some aesthetic concerns and, uh, and lean one way towards the other. Uh, I, neither of them is a bad solution. It's just, uh, there's, there's different benefits and, uh, and downsides to each. All right. Okay. So the, the installers will install the AP and the antennas. Um, I'm guessing you stage the APs before giving the equipment to the installers, right? Um, yeah, either you can stage them or, uh, you can, uh, work with the installers to stage them together. Um, I am a big proponent of staging as much as you can and getting, um, as much as you can assembled prior to the installation okay. um, with a single team. So you can train that team on um, how the antennas mount to the brackets. Uh, you can train that team on how the antennas leads go to the access point. Uh, and you can complete quality control uh, as part of that um, that assembly effort. So you can look through and look at every single access point and uh, all the antenna leads before they get deployed out to the bowl. Um, antennas, for the most part, are passive components. So if they've uh, if they've hooked the 2.4 gigahertz lead up to the five gigahertz um, uh, up to the five gigahertz radio, yeah. uh, you're going to have some problems. And because it's passive component, it's a really difficult time to track that down. So, uh, you you really want to, um, have them assembled correctly and, uh, and have the opportunity to do the quality control on that, uh, on that assembly, uh, as much as you can. Um, and then when you, when you do that staging, you're saving time on the, uh, on the assembly effort. So instead of having to drag, lug the tools around to each location to assemble the enclosure, you can do it all at once and, uh, and, and develop an assembly line, if you will. Do you to, have, uh, to make sure, sure that it's all accurate. Uh, do you have any tips um, for labeling? Do you label APs, APs and antennas? No label at all? How do you usually do it? Uh, it, it it's really dependent on, uh, um, on which way you're going uh, and, and some of the venue requirements. So uh, if, if you're doing an overhead, if you're, if you're pre-assembling the antenna, and uh, the access point together and getting the cabling leads in place that you can just label the, the access point uh, and be, be fine. Uh, if you're doing an AP within an enclosure uh, that you can, uh, I'd recommend labeling both the access point and the enclosure. So whether the, um, whether the enclosure is open or closed, you can tell where that's supposed to be. Uh, and if you're naming is section row and seat, once it's assembled, the installer, all they have to do is grab, grab that finished enclosure, look at the name and immediately know where it's going without after having to reference a map. Okay. Yeah. And that speeds up everything. And, and once again, less, less, uh, less mistakes. Yeah. Um, and you, when you, when you're doing assembly is do, do sections, that, um, do similar, uh, models and uh, and take your deployment models and do them all at once and uh, okay. group them together is that if you're if you've got section one two three and four all grouped together uh, there's less chance of someone grabbing the wrong access point and putting it in place uh, or having the installers waste time trying to find the couple of 
couple of access points that they need uh, to finish off section one. Uh, if they're all grouped together and they're palletized by section or um, by basically any um, any delineator that you want, but uh, uh, but organized in a fashion that they can find them easily, um, the installation time takes less time and uh, is more organized and is prone to fewer errors. Yeah. And I remember you talking about it that uh, during your WLPC presentation, and I believe you shared some pictures, right? Um, yeah, we. Uh, um, I shared some pictures from a, a college deployment that we had done. That uh, we had the um, the access points were um, pre-mounted into the enclosures and uh, labeled and ready to go, um, and then they were just all stacked together. And uh, it, really, it really made for an easy time of, uh, um, of the installers being able to grab them and, uh, and go and deploy. Um, one of the other benefits of the staging is uh, that you can do inventory at the, at the same time. So uh, taking your spreadsheet and having the installers be able to scan the serial number if, or MAC address or whatever your, whatever your vendor of choice uses as an identifier in their controller man management solution. Uh, is being able to scan that in uh, into the spreadsheet and get it associated with a name. So if you're doing if you're doing a scanner uh, that uh, you, you you definitely don't want any manual entry on on that effort. Uh, you're going to find some errors if you do that, and the uh, the scanner gets it right into the spreadsheet uh, quickly and accurately. Okay, and you met, you mentioned um, training you know, a few people in putting everything together, the antenna uh, with the AP in the enclosure, if you have any and so on. So once, once a unit is ready to get installed, uh, do you guide the installer into how to install the unit properly, especially I'm thinking if you have directional antenna on the over overhead design so that just to make sure that they install it properly so it matches your design? It, yeah, that uh, I, I'm really a, a big proponent of um, taking uh, uh, demo installations and working directly with the installer okay. on them. Is taking two, three, four, five access points uh, that are going to be repeatable across the sections. Is that if you're doing under seat, um, odds are that 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 under seat um, model is going to be repeated across the bowl, or if you're doing overhead. Um, that uh, across the east and west side, it's going to be repeated. So mm -hmm. taking a couple of example installations, working with them uh, to figure out uh, to figure out how they're mounting them, how they're putting a secondary arrest cable on them, um, what angle that they need to uh, need to be placing those overheads at if you're doing overhead design. Uh, and then once you bring those up, you get the opportunity to do validation of your uh, your design. So uh, once they're powered up, is being able to survey those small sections, uh, validate and tweak anything that you may need to to uh, to make sure that it uh, that it meets your design requirements. Okay, and and during the during the installation, uh, you as a Wi-Fi lead or you know project manager, do you stay on site to? Um, keep an eye on the installations um, and, and fix any issues rapidly or do you just let them work and then come back on site afterwards to do your validations? Um, there, with the example uh, sections, you definitely want to be on site for, yeah. uh, for the deployment and then you want to be able to do the validation uh, and then you want to keep a close eye on them throughout the pro the process. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say you need to watch over their shoulder the entire yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a if you've got a good group of installers that uh, that know what they're doing, and uh, and uh, understand uh, understand your design and uh, and, and what they're uh, what they're deploying, that uh, some quality control here and there is uh, is is still necessary. Um, but watching over them constantly is, is typically not, uh, one thing, uh, particularly for the overhead deployments is, uh, is figuring out, um, both for the example installs, as well as the, uh, the ongoing installs is how they're determining the angle 
uh, the the antennas and how you're communicating the correct angle back to them. Um, so you've done your example installation uh, and you've got the, the AP up and in place and you do your survey. Uh, you, you, you're going to be doing some tweaking and then you need to figure out a way to communicate to them what that angle is supposed to be and how they're supposed to be measuring it is, are you utilizing a, um, a laser on the front of the, uh, on the front of the antenna and pointing it at a specific spot? Uh, Scott Lester, uh, I think his blog is the it rebel.com has a great write up on a, um, a rig that he, uh, that he did made out of uh, plywood, to uh, to mount a laser to the front of directional antennas so you can just have them point at a specific spot uh another option is to have an angle measure on the uh, on the back side of the antenna uh but uh it, it has to be consistent regardless of what you do uh to make sure that they're all the same uh one really cool thing that's coming is that uh Everest networks is a relatively new player to the space um one of their new products is going to have an accelerometer in the antenna uh, that they've got integrated APs and antennas. Um, so being able to utilize that for figuring out whether all the installations are the same and then uh, being able to alarm on any, uh, any antenna angles that have changed throughout the install. Uh, it's a, it's a really cool uh, solution that, uh, that solves a couple of problems that you run into both from a deployment and then an ongoing maintenance perspective. Yeah, th those are great ideas. Um, I remember Scott uh, Lester, he also gave a presentation at WLPC regarding this uh, this kit. Um, I think it was this year as well. If you go back on the YouTube channel, well, Wireless LAN Pros, you can probably find it. Uh, and the idea is pretty much to install a, a laser on the antenna and then, you know, using the laser to face a, sp a specific section of the of the uh, of the uh, stadium and then you pretty much tell the, tell the installer can you face it towards the you know section b 220 for instance and then the uh, it will help the installer to align the antenna properly it, yeah and i think that's uh scott's made a great solution to uh, to solving an antenna aiming um problem uh but from a from a design perspective as well that you, you can't just um you can't just throw an antenna up and do some trigonometry on where it's going to be aiming based on what the manufacturer says the antenna type is. Uh, so uh, a 60 degree antenna is measured as 60 degrees, but only when um, the signal at the edges where the signal drops 3 dB. Yeah. But that signal continues to go beyond 60 degrees. Uh, so you need to understand how the antennas that you're deploying actually propagate and uh, what you want to use and what you don't want to use when you're doing the design. All right. So now we have our APs installed. How do we configure them? Um, as automated as possible. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, That's a very you... two, 2018 answer. <laughs> Uh, you do not want to be clicking through a GUI or manually applying configurations through the CLI um, with your keyboard uh, when you've got 1,400 or 1,600 access points. Um, you will mess it up. Uh, you will cause problems. Uh, you will have errors. You will spend more time than it needs to. Uh, and you're, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your customer's time when you do that. Um, doing some some basic math uh if you're only changing five settings on each ap and you've got 1400 ap's with a one percent error rate you're gonna have 70 configuration settings that you've configured wrong uh and that's unacceptable so how do you one of the things it? yeah one of the things that we do is uh that spreadsheet that we create yeah. um that is the feeder data into um, a config script that we use to uh, so it, it allows for CLI templates to be built and then just have values inserted from a spreadsheet. Um, so we can do 1400 access points in 
10 minutes. Uh, and if we've got to do naming convention changes that we can update those, or we just want to tweak power or tweak the channel, uh, that we can do all of those, have those channels be unique and, uh, and have it done accurately and quickly. So how did you, did you write the script yourself? Um, it was not me. It was actually one of my colleagues that, uh, that, that made the, the script. Uh, so I am, I am not a programmer extraordinaire. I, I okay. took a Python class at WLPC, but that's, uh, that's <laughs> about the extent of it. Um, uh, but it, you, you don't, you don't necessarily have to be, um, yeah. that there's some, there's some functions. Uh, I've seen some cool things done with, uh, um, with Google sheets to develop, um, uh, develop config templates, um, or even hiring someone to, uh, to create a little Python script or a little applet that you can use. Uh, if you, if you do one project with, um, a thousand or so APs that, uh, it's, it'll pay for itself. Uh, and then yeah. you can use it if, if it's designed well, you can use it for other things. So our, our config script I use for, um, developing, uh, router configs and VRRP and, uh, uh, MLAG and, and port configurations that uh, it, it's powerful when you've got the ability to insert values from a spreadsheet. So, yeah, I was just, I was asking you because I was just wondering, you know, how do you uh, proof test your script um, that you're going to deploy on 1400 APs, right? You need to make sure it doesn't screw something up at scale. You know what I mean? Yes, uh, that, that uh, you hopefully have a lab um, and can play around with it a little bit, uh, and then you can um, deploy it on maybe one or two access points within the environment, and then try 10 and take a look at it and make sure it's working correctly. And then you can start to scale up from there. Um, that uh, I won't call it automation, but scripting is, uh, is an incredibly powerful tool. But if you've got bad data going in or you've done something incorrectly on the templates, um, it is a powerful way to screw yourself at scale. So talking about configurations, uh, is there anything specific we need to think about when we do configuration for, you know, a very high density environment like stadiums, um, many, maybe minimum d uh, data rates or any other features, uh, proprietary features, um, you know, provided by vendors that you, any, you know, features you can think of specific to very high density deployments that you use? Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash clear to send and browse the fantastic selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Again, go to audibletrial.com slash clear to send. Um, so it, it'll really depend on the vendor and what the, what the options are uh, for them. Uh, some of the more common ones are probe suppression, um, which allow the APs to ignore probes that come in below a certain signal level. Um, that, uh, if you're, if you're too, if you're two under seat access points away, you don't really need to be responding to that, um, that request from a client, you know, you as the administrator know that there are, or the, the deployer know that there are better access points for it to, to go to. Um, yeah. Uh, RSSI based disassociation is another one where you can set a threshold where um, you'll disassociate the client. Um, the, uh, Cisco has uh, RxOp um, that, uh, and then there's, there's some airtime fairness mechanisms as well. But the, uh, well, I, I won't say whether you should or should not use any of these um, as a as a general rule because yeah. different vendors deploy them differently. But you need to understand with the product that you're using and the feature that you're trying to enable what it actually does, not what marketing says it does, not what sales says it does, what it actually does, and the mechanisms behind it, uh, and any limitations that there may be behind it. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, I know on some vendors, airtime fairness. If you enable airtime fairness, there's a hard set client limit uh, for the access point. And in LPP, you're going to hit that. may not be on all the access points, but you, you're particularly the, uh, the access points that you've put at the entrance and exits, they're going to get higher client counts than most, most environments. Yeah, yeah. So uh, ha having, having an ally, having someone that you can reach out to within the manufacturer that, uh, that you're dealing with, 
uh, is is great to have if you're not familiar with a specific feature. If they just rolled it out, um, where you're looking to clarify that someone that can get you in touch with someone that knows the product or knows the feature better than you, uh, it is not uh, it, it is not weakness to ask for help. It is not weakness to ask for knowledge. It's weakness to fail when you didn't. Yeah, and I would say it's hard to test and verify in just a lab because some of these features would just uh will need like a lot of you know client client device connected to actually show it you know their weaknesses if you see what i mean it, it, yeah how do you how do you simulate a um an underseat deployment with a thousand aps and aluminum seating in a lab uh, that you just can't so uh yeah. If you can, if you can reach out to the manufacturer, they may have seen it deployed somewhere else. They may know some limitations of it um, that uh, you, you need to understand what the features can and can't do. All right, and you also have the community, right? You can reach out to the community. You never know. The the Wi-Fi community is. Uh, I I don't really know how to describe. I've never encountered uh, um, a professional community like. Um, the wireless community, that they are so open to sharing knowledge. They're so open to communicating on strange issues. Um, Twitter is a great resource uh, that uh, to, to reach out to and uh, that someone will respond on, uh, on any odd issues that you're running into or odd questions. Um, there's a Slack group that's run by uh, uh, Sam Clements and uh, uh, Manuel Sard. Uh, that uh, is a great community as well, has uh, vendor-specific channels and a general channel. Um, that there's, there's so many great resources out there and there's so much knowledge and everyone's willing to share and help. Um, all right. I agree with that, by the way. Um, so n now you've done your, you know, your configuration. Um, how do you validate everything in the stadium? How much time does it take? I'm, I'm sure you're going to say depends, but <laughs> if you were to yeah, describe it's, it. it, it's always, it depends. Uh, so you never have enough, uh, you never have enough time to do what you want to do. And it takes more time than you'd like it to, um, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, any, anything you can do on the front end to validate, um, that, uh, surveys that, you, uh, uh, surveys that you can do to, to make sure that the signal's going where you want it to. And that, um, and that you're getting uh, you're getting the metrics that you want, um, but both uh, the RF metrics as well as the user experience is uh, yeah. R the RF metrics only speak to the wireless. Um, the user experience metrics can speak to the whole system. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I know uh, iPerf isn't perfect, and speed test isn't perfect, but it is an indicator of the overall user experience. Uh, not not just the RF, but going um, having traffic go through the access points and through the switching and through the routing and utilizing DNS. Um, yeah. So, uh, You're you, testing you the need whole to path. use, yeah, you, you need to use those to figure out whether it works. Cause if you, if you just test the RF, um, you're, you're not looking at the whole system. Um, so talking about the, um, the, the validating the RF, we both know that the RF is going to change. The RF environment is going to change as you bring thousands of people into the stadium. Um, do you, do you just wait for a big event? Uh, how do you organize the validation with the customer? Uh, so, so part of your, part of your design at some point within your design, you should have had some real bodies in the seats. Uh, and it may not be at every venue that you do this, but you should have some data on an underseat design and, um, how much loss you're going to get across an example section. Um, you, you can't get it exact because um, seat pitch is going to change and, uh, and the height of the concrete is going to change. Uh, but uh, you should understand uh, how much loss you're going to get across each row of people. Uh, so you can do some empty venue testing and then compensate your... Okay. Um, compensate your survey to yeah. um to account for that okay so there are some validations that can be made before like a big event right 
Yeah. And, uh, your, your channel plan that you can, uh, you can certainly do some optimization, uh, empty venue. Um, it'll, Im- it'll improve, um, once you get people in the seats, but, uh, but if you want to try out a diff- couple of different models, um, that, uh, the, the metrics will prove correct. Um, okay. Metrics will prove correct in an empty stadium as well. So if you've got improvement on your channel, uh, on your channel overlap, in an empty venue, you'll see the same thing in a, um, in a full venue. And then you're going to have to wait for the big event to make sure that you can handle the capacity. Absolutely. There, there is no way to model that many people in an, in an environment and, uh, what it does to the RF and, uh, the absorption of the signal and, uh, the, the stoppages of, of the reflection, um, that you'll get with having people in the seats. Yeah. So, uh, the the problem, but the benefit and the problem with live testing during an event is that there are people in the seats. So you may have been able to walk every single row when you were an empty test, but you cannot do that um, when there's people in the seats. You have to only walk up and down the aisles uh, and you've got people walking around you. You've got um, uh, fans that are drinking uh, with uh, empty beer cups that may be bumping into you. So, uh, Ekahau is powerful and, uh, um, but for the live testing, um, we use it sparingly and in, uh, in specific areas that, uh, okay. a lot of times we'll look at, uh, we'll look at air check, which has, uh, exportable data that we can, uh, we can look at after the fact. Okay. And, uh, one really cool thing when you're looking at, uh, when you're trying to look at uh, signal from specific client devices is that, uh, iOS has the Apple airport utility, which supports data export, which Wi-Fi Explorer can import and visualize. So you can look at specific signal level from, um, from your target Apple device after the fact. Yeah. And I guess what you can do during the live event is actually really test the user experience, right? Because if you have any capacity issue, you should be able to see that and measure that, I guess. Yeah, you can get, uh, you can get some of your, um, basic wireless metrics out of the air check. Um, but d- completing iPerf with, uh, with your iOS and Android devices, which, uh, in, in LPV, they're your target devices that you're not, you're not looking to target your, uh, yeah. sidekick and you're not looking to target your MacBook pro. Um, you're, you're looking for those one by one and, uh, in some cases two by two, uh, devices and, and seeing how well they perform. Yeah, and, and, and the customer might have a specific application they're using for, you know, service or another, and you can, you can also test that during the event. Uh, yeah, if they've got, uh, if they've got in-seat ordering, uh, yeah, be sure to test that. If they've got um, live video delivery as part of the venue app, um, test that. That's, uh, that's, that's a target application that, that they bought this solution to service. Make sure it works. Yeah. All right, uh, Perfect. During the live testing, uh, the planning is really the, the key is, uh, is trying to figure out which areas you're going to test before you start, um, and, uh, and map that out. Uh, and, uh, don't, don't try to, don't try to analyze the data during the event. Your event is a limited amount of time to collect data. And if you have a good model and, uh, you have a good process for, um, where you are, what your file is named, uh, and, uh, and saving that, um, saving that data, you can look at it after the fact, after the fact and, uh, and find any issues or, uh, or decide on any corrections, uh, that, uh, you want to be collecting as much data as you can during the event. Cause that's the only time you're going to have people in the seats. So do you plan for extra time? Um, like after the fact to analyze all this data, um, do you plan on time to go back on site? Uh, maybe if, if you find any issues or maybe do you plan on attending a second event? Uh, yeah. So typically, um, for the large venues is that part of, um, part of the initial install is, uh, is multiple events of support, um, to get some testing and tuning done and, uh, and make sure everything is going smoothly, catching anything that may have been missed, um, during the, uh, the deployment, whether it's, it was just, uh, 
the the venue identifying coverage areas that or areas that they wanted covered, and then during an event finding some uh, some backhaul closet that gets used in a different way than they initially thought uh, that you may need to add some service to. So uh, you uh, you want to plan for event support and uh, and plan for um, tweaking and tuning. Okay. Uh, the the event support they're uh, they're long days. So, uh, you get there um, you, you get there early and uh, you want to do your health checks and make sure there's no nothing catastrophic that that happened while you were not there, and then uh, um, do a quick walkthrough, uh, make yeah. sure everything is is as expected. Uh, you've got uh, these venues are constantly under construction and maintenance, so you've got. Um, folks that are scraping and pressure washing and uh, and painting the structural steel that uh, your lovely access points may be mounted to. So uh, I ran into one venue that uh, I think was the first venue that we did uh, that uh, they uh, they were painting the steel and uh, the antenna was in the way. So they loosened up the mounting bracket and tilted the antenna up and painted underneath it and then just um, tilted it back down. So uh, when we got there, uh, for the event after that happened is, uh, it was not pointing down in the direction that we wanted it to be. So, uh, that had to be corrected, uh, pretty quickly. Yeah. I think I agree with you for, uh, for the event support. I've done a, I've done a few event supports, not for stadiums, but more for convention centers or, you know, big meetings. And I always like to arrive the day, you know, prior to the event, um, go on site, maybe do a, um, you know, quick site survey to get a sense of uh, the RF and prepare myself. I know where the APs are, you know, which channel they use or whatever. If I need to tweak any configurations, I can do it before the event. And then when you, you know, at the event, you're going to have a lot of interactions with the, you know, the customer, the users, and, you know, uh, you're going to be collecting data. So like you said, it's a long day, so it's important to plan it ahead. So you're organized. And you're ready. You're also available for the customer, right? It, yeah, and the 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 fans, the fans of the users. Uh, it's uh, it's important to keep an eye on them where they are. So whether it's walking around and uh, and maybe maybe talking to the, some of the fans, uh, or yeah, just keeping an eye out in the lines and seeing if uh, if people are on their phones. Um, uh, I, I like to use TweetDeck to uh, to keep an eye on social media. Um, have a couple of different streams that are running to uh, to hit some keywords on the venue name and Wi-Fi. That's um, that's a good see tip. If there's any com- yeah, that's- see if there's any complaints coming in. That, that uh, if you're not if you're not meeting your your users where they are, um, you're really not doing your job. So uh, try to try to keep an eye on any place your users may be. Do you uh, do you smile when you see someone sharing a speed test results with uh, Wi-Fi? Is awesome here. Uh, it's always, especially the first event, is uh, when you see when you see that come in and uh, and see good results that uh, you, you've put put a lot of effort into a long deployment. Um, it's it's nice to seeing that uh, uh, good results come out of it. It is not obviously if it's not for from you, right? If it's from someone else, it, yeah, <laughs> that I'm not uh, trying not to uh, not to post your own uh, speed tests. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Chris. Um, yeah, you wanted to add something. I, one more thing, I, I think, uh, when we're talking about event support and being in uh, in large public venues, is that uh, these are unique environments. With um, there may be uh, sports personalities or news personalities or um, musicians uh, walking around in, uh, particularly in the back of house areas. Is that remember that you're a professional and you have a job to do, and they have a job to do. And your your job is not to interact with them unless there is a specific need for it. So you you, you can't go up and ask um, and ask Tom Brady and Bob Miller and Beyonce for an autograph while you're working. You're a professional and and really need to act like it and uh, and be a representative of the venue. All right. <laughs> All right, Chris, thank you very much. I think we had a very good talk here. Last time we talked more about the, you know, why the design and how we, we design a Wi-Fi for stadium. Today, we, we asked you a lot of how questions uh, for the implementation. So I think you, you gave a lot of great tips uh, out there uh, for anyone wanting to, uh, you know, to, to uh, ready to deploy Wi-Fi stadium uh, design. 
So I think it's great. If you guys have any more questions, feel free to send us some comments. Uh, we try to answer them. If we need to do a follow-up episode, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll do so. Um, if Chris agrees, of course. Um, and then, uh, Chris, uh, if people want to reach out to you, I know you are present on Twitter. Do you want to give out your Twitter handle? Um, yeah, that uh, you, uh, you can reach me on Twitter at, at the CM Reed. Uh, and uh, I definitely, I'd love to be back on if, uh, if there are any follow-up questions. Thank you very much, Chris. So the first episode was episode number 23. Um, and this, this episode... <clears throat> Uh, this episode would be number 127. So if you guys want to follow that on the website, cleartosend.net. Thank you once again for listening and we'll talk to you next week for the brand new episode on Clear to Send. Bye-bye.